Welcome everyone to our Banquet of the Word presentation today. We will be uh, treating Ash Wednesday and uh, the first five Sundays of Lent. The Tuesday before Palm Sunday, today is February 13th, um, the, tu the Tuesday before Palm Sunday, uh, we will uh, have another Banquet of the Word, the next Banquet of the Word, which will deal with Palm Sunday, Holy Week, and Easter. So, um, but right now, we are solidly into Lent. Well, not quite right now, because, um, well, today is Fat Tuesday. Mardi Gras. So happy Mardi Gras to everybody. Um, why is it called Mardi Gras? Well, that's French for Fat Tuesday. Why is it called Fat Tuesday? Well, a number of reasons. Uh, one, one of which is uh, the day before Lent, you gorge yourself on the things that you have to give up during Lent. And particularly in many cultures, the the uh, uh, Central European cultures in particular, uh, you'd give up meat, you would give up fatty foods, give up oil perhaps, give up eggs and all of those sorts of things. So uh, the day before you kind of uh, gorge yourself. Now this day is also called, as you see, Carnival. And Carnival uh, which is particularly celebrated in Latin countries by that name, uh, means carne vale. Carnis means flesh, and vale is the Latin word for bye-bye, goodbye. So this is the day on which you say goodbye to the flesh. Now, that can have two meanings, of course. Goodbye to meat, or goodbye to all of the pleasures of the flesh, which is, I think, one reason why carnival tends to be marked in many countries by an excess of pleasures of the flesh. Uh, so much so that um, probably many people, including maybe those in New Orleans, you could, uh, I, I, I can't really speak for that, I'm just speculating, but they don't too much like it when Lent comes early, like it does this year. It was even a week earlier, two years ago. But um, they don't much like it when Lent comes early. They'd much rather have it late. Why? Because Mardi Gras celebration, the celebration of Carnival, begins with the Epiphany, January 6th. So the longer, the later Lent is, the longer you have to... Um, indulge in all of the wonderful celebrations that are kind of naughty and that you know that you will have to give up beginning with Ash Wednesday. In some cultures, uh, British in particular, I think it's called Pancake Tuesday. Uh, this was the day to perhaps gorge yourself for simple people. The biggest indulgence might be pancakes made out of um, eggs added to the flour and milk and um, salt and possibly sweetening, but those things that uh, kind of also symbolize what you are uh, giving up. You know, ordinary bread that's baked could be just flour and water with some leavening. Um, but pancakes usually have all kinds of other ingredients that uh, just make them very, very nice. So Pancakes Tuesday, and of course, Shrove Tuesday. You've heard the expression Shrove Tuesday. To shrive means to absolve, to forgive. This was the day when, particularly in response to all of the excesses of the flesh, shall we say, uh, that characterized this day, uh, many of the church people would say, hmm, that's not really the way, the, the way you should be preparing for Lent. The way you should be preparing for Lent is to go to confession, to call to mind the reason why you are doing Lenten penance. So that Lenten, Lent was often seen not as the time for uh, 
for reconciliation or confession, but, but Shrove Tuesday was seen as the time for confession, and then Lent was the time to, well, do your penance. So that's where we get the word Shrove Tuesday. Uh, there's an interesting uh, Peter Bruegel, the elder, this is a portion of a rather famous painting of his that you can't see too clearly here. But this is the conflict between Mardi Gras and Shrove Tuesday, or Mardi Gras and Lent. And uh, what you see here is a religious penitential procession coming in from the left, and all of the revelries of uh, eating, drinking, and doing other things, which uh, uh, Bruegel is exceptionally good at depicting uh, being done, and they're kind of just coming into conflict. So that's a little bit of a background on today, and what begins tomorrow? Well, tomorrow begins Lent, of course. Uh, I'd just like to take a little tour of this year's Gospels. And I could go into, you know, in some parishes, some of the masses will have last year's Gospels, year A, those particularly who are celebrating Christian initiation, and uh, that's the time of the uh, uh, rite of election and the scrutinies for those who are being initiated at Easter time. They use the the Gospels of Year A always, which are those lengthy stories in John about uh, the woman at the well, the um, man born blind, and the uh, raising of Lazarus. But uh, there's a lot more in John's Gospels for Lent than just those three, even though they are very major incidents. So we're going to go through what the Church gives us in Year B. First of all, Ash Wednesday is the same every year, the same gospel, the same scripture readings. And the gospel from the uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount, um, Jesus is speaking of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving as the three pillars of our Lenten practice. But they are also the pillars of our lifetime practice. The purpose of Lent is not to spend six weeks doing something that you can then give up at Easter and forget about for another year. The purpose of Lent is as a training ground for the rest of our Christian life. So what we do during Lent, as we'll see, is particularly beginning with prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, should be what characterizes our entire life. And Lent is a time to, well, just do a little training uh, to get better at what we are supposed to be doing all the time. Now, the first, the first and second Sundays of Lent are basically have the same theme every year. And that is, but as depicted in the three Gospels appropriate for the three years. Last year was Matthew, this year is Mark. Next year will be Luke. Uh, we'll see what happens to John in a minute. But this year it's Mark's account of the temptation in the wilderness. It's always the uh, 40 days in the desert that characterizes the first Sunday of Lent. The second Sunday of Lent every year concentrates on the transfiguration of Jesus. And then uh, the third Sunday this year is... Uh, the uh, telling in John's Gospel of Jesus cleansing the temple and reflection on the meaning of his cleansing the temple, which is unique to John's Gospel. The fourth Sunday, uh, Nicodemus is, is the third chapter of John, still pretty early in John's Gospel, the visit by night of Nicodemus, where Jesus gives the famous statement that's uh, uh, quoted in ball games, you know, on the uh, on, on on the banners and the the advertising on the side. God so loved the world, uh, John three sixteen, and then 
the fifth Sunday uh, <laughs> this year is the last week of Jesus' life, and it's on the hour of the Son of Man. So we will be getting into those. So let's begin with uh, beginning the gospel uh, for Ash Wednesday. And Jesus said to his disciples, take care not to perform righteous deeds in order that people may see them. Otherwise, you will have no recompense from your heavenly Father. Okay, so that sets things up. However, we need to see this passage from, uh, from Matthew's Gospel as right in the middle. It's the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. How does the Sermon on the Mount begin? Of course, with the Beatitudes. That sort of sets the stage. And then Jesus calling his disciples salt and light. And then he goes into those uh, famous, uh, you have heard it, the, the kind of the defining of the new law. You have heard it said in the past, but I say to you. So what he's doing is not abrogating the old law, but rather fulfilling it. What you have said, heard said in the past, um, uh, do this or don't do that, but I say to you, and then he concentrates on the internalization of those actions. So that the law is not merely concentrated on external behaviors, but that which gives birth to the external behaviors. Then comes, he talks about the three pillars of life. And um, beginning with, uh, well, the righteous deeds basically begins the idea. You know, whenever you're doing, whenever you're doing what you're supposed to do, don't pay attention to getting praise for it. Look at him, how holy he is, um, or she. Uh, how pious he or she is, how often they say the rosary, how often they do this. Uh, but rather do that uh, where only your Father will see you. Do it for God, uh, not for others. Okay, let's go ahead. When you give alms, do not blow a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, to win praise of others. And then I said to you, may I have revealed the reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right is doing, so that your alms giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will repay you. One thing that a number of people will uh, think about and comment on is that Jesus' hearers, they were Jewish, but they knew Greek culture. Greek culture had been a part of their life for the, the past several hundred years, and there was often conflict with Greek culture. When the Romans came, as I reflected last time, uh, something that isn't often uh, recognized is that Nazareth was probably something of a construction town, a town where laborers building the Roman city of Sepphoris, which was a project of Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great. Sepphoris, uh, uh, construction workers, uh, many of them lived in Nazareth. They would have commuted, not a terribly long commute. Walking from Nazareth to Sephora was probably shorter than a lot of commutes here on the freeways in Los Angeles are. And so uh, Jesus was familiar with Greco-Roman culture simply because it was right next door and he may very well during what we call his hidden life, he may very well have been a construction worker on that city. So he was pretty familiar with the life of the Greco-Roman people, the Gentiles there, as well as a sizable Jewish community there. There's a huge, not huge, but a very large uh, theater in Sephora that Jesus himself 
certainly knew about and may have uh, participated in the construction of it. And the Greek word for hypocrite is actually a, uh, a, a word that refers to acting. An actor is a hypocritos. That means one who adopts a mask. And you know how Greek drama, you've got signified by the two masks, the comedy with a grin and the tragedy with a frown. And so what he is saying here is in what is the very heart of your outward spiritual life, don't just be an actor. Don't just give in order to make an impression on people, but it has to come from the heart. But what, when he's calling people hypocrites, what he's basically saying to them is take your mask off. Take your mask off. Be real. Let, the, let what you do outwardly flow from and express what you are inwardly, which is really the meaning of the entire Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and so what he's saying here is not so much that a, a question of reward and punishment. It is really a question of um, uh, the life of heaven, the eternal life, is the continuation and bringing to fulfillment of how you live life now. So if you help others because of what is inside of you unfolding for on behalf of the other person, that's what you're going to be doing for all eternity. If you're compassionate now in uh, in sharing what you are and have with others, you are being well prepared for the kind of sharing that God will um, expect of us who participate in his life for all eternity. So our, our eternity will definitely be um, uh, contemplating God, but in God, behaving towards one another as God behaves among us. So the, the happiness, the joy of heaven will be that we are together relating to God as his children and receiving from him the gift of life eternally. That's a pretty good idea, isn't it? So that basically is what Jesus is saying there about giving alms. Give it because you are behaving. In doing that, you are behaving like God the Father. Please continue. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who love to stand and pray in synagogues and on street corners so that others may see them. And then I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go to your inner room close the door and pray to your father in secret and your father who sees in secret will repay you. Okay. Um, it would seem that those religious people who wore the mask of religion uh, love to pray publicly. He, in Luke's gospel he's quoted as, as giving a, uh, a parable about that. The uh, Pharisee uh, who was probably poor, uh, but standing in pride and praying. And the publican, the tax collector, who was probably rich because he was wealthy from ill-gotten gains, knowing that he was kind of locked into his sin, just can't do anything except stand back in the shadows and beat his breast and saying, Lord, have mercy on me. There is no mercy for me in the ways of the world. There is only mercy uh, from you. And then Jesus, of course, says, you know, the Pharisee did not go back to his home changed. The tax collector went back changed. And I think this is unfolding 
kind of the same thing. Pray to your father in secret. Now, that doesn't mean you don't go to Mass. That doesn't mean you don't pray communally, uh, pray together. Uh, praying together has always been a part of our, our life as, as Christians, whether it's gathering for the Eucharist or praying on other types of occasions. Um, we need to pray together because prayer isn't just a me and God thing. Prayer isn't just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm relating to God, I'm doing, I'm doing good for God, and uh, God will do good for me. Uh, prayer does have to include a relationship with one another. However, in a very real way, your private personal prayer is the foundation of how you pray with others. If, if the only thing that you do is public prayer, that is going to be empty without private prayer. And I think that's uh, a, a very key thing here. Now, in Matthew's Gospel, you notice it goes from 1 to 6 and then skips to 16. What is skipped there is uh, the Lord's Prayer and then the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer, his little uh, two-sentence discourse on forgiveness. If you <coughs> forgive others, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. If you do not forgive others, you can't expect forgiveness from your Heavenly Father. So. The Lord's Prayer is put there. It's omitted in this Gospel because it may be something of an insertion by Matthew. It's, it's found in Luke in a different context. But uh, uh, it, it kind of, how would I say, interrupts the flow that the Church wants here by starting by, uh, by the parallelism of, of almsgiving, prayer, and then next is fasting. When you fast, do not look dumb like the hypocrites. They, they neglect their appearance so that they may appear to others to be fasting. And then they say to you that they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you may not appear to be fasting except to your father who is hidden. And your father who sees what is hidden will be paid. Now, of course, there's an interesting paradox here, isn't there? Because he's telling us, don't look like you're fasting, anoint your head, wash your face, take groom yourself, take care of yourself, and tomorrow we are going to do go everywhere and do everything with a dirty face. <laughs> and uh, so one of the things that, and I think G.K. Chesterton was a master at pointing this out, one of the things that we need to be comfortable with, which I think a lot of very fundamentalist Catholics, the ones who are you know, ultra-traditionalist, who, for whom it's got to be this way or no way, the, the uh, thing that we're not comfortable with but we need to get comfortable with is paradox that there are occasions where things may be some way, and there are occasions when things may seem just exactly the opposite. And we can't always reconcile those perfectly. However, the thing that reconciles this paradox, I think, is in our day and age and our culture, uh, it's kind of embarrassing to walk around with a, um, with, with, with a dirty forehead. And uh, that one day a year, we kind of have to get out of ourselves, you know, uh, repent, as it were, uh, get out of ourselves, as we'll see in a minute, um, so that we can let God and let the Holy Spirit take over. So in some ways, our walking around with uh, ashes on our foreheads should not be telling the world, look how great I am, I'm Catholic and you're not, I'm going to go to heaven and you're not, but rather what it needs to be is, um, you know, this is a sign that I take seriously something that is, for the most part and for most people, including ourselves, uncomfortable. And uh, uh, what that sometimes means is, as, as I think uh, 
we've all experienced. You know, we have people looking kind of strange at us, and maybe uh, we're afraid that they're going to laugh at us or make fun of us. But we also have people asking about it in all sincerity, and this becomes a chance for us to tell them the, the deeper meaning of what the Lord is calling us to as um, in accord with the way that the Lord has created and redeemed us. So that is it for tomorrow, for Ash Wednesday. Now here's the first Sunday of Lent, which is quite short. So whoever has it, read the first part, if you would. The Spirit drove Jesus out into the desert, and he remained in the desert for 40 days, tempted by Satan. He was among wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Now, Matthew and Luke give the substance of those temptations as three temptations, three distinct, attractive things that Satan presents to Jesus that would go contrary to his ministry, that he, in no uncertain terms, overcomes and says no to. Mark, which is the oldest of the Gospels, the first of the Gospels to be written down, uh, simply goes to the heart of things and says he was tempted by Satan, he was among the wild beasts, he fasted uh, for 40 days. Actually, it doesn't say there that he fasted, does it? He just remained in the desert for 40 days, tempted by Satan. And among wild beasts and angels ministered to him. He was still drawing on the power of God, his Father, through the, through the angels. What is interesting, this takes place right after the baptism in the Jordan. In fact, if you've been to the Holy Land, and that struck me last year when I was there just very briefly, you, it's probably half a day's walk at most from the place of the baptism in the Jordan River and the Mount of Temptation, where there are many caves where Jesus uh, is traditionally uh, said to, to, to stay. So it's very close. Jesus came out of the baptism, and uh, within the same day, he could have been up uh, at, at, in that wilderness. It's the mountain wilderness from the Jordan Valley, between the Jordan Valley and Jerusalem. It would overlook the Jordan Valley and the Dead Sea. So uh, what is interesting is that in all of the Gospels, the, he is depicted as receiving the Spirit in baptism. Uh, we could go all kinds of theological commentary on that, but you know this is certainly the spirit which empowered his going forth into ministry. And the verb that is used always is not merely led, you know, sort of taking him by the hand and uh, and walking up the mountain or telling him, guiding him, you know, I'll take this path and go up there. The word that's used is drove. Now, not driving a car, but driving a herd of cattle, you know, with a whip. Uh, so the Spirit drove Jesus out into the desert. Sort of like, well, with the baptism, Jesus humanly had to struggle with the work of the Spirit that would ultimately triumph in his ministry. But he had to struggle with, what does that mean? How do I do it? What do I have to give up? What do I have to do in order to be faithful to this ministry? You know, if, we, if we take our faith seriously, Jesus experienced every single temptation, every single problem, every single difficulty in some way that we experience. He didn't have an edge. Jesus wasn't just sort of a, a human puppet that was, well, you know, the outcome was foreordained. No. He had to. He had to struggle with the same uh, sort of reluctance and, uh, you know, my God, I'd rather do anything but this. I'd rather be anywhere except here. 
You know, and we've all had to struggle with that same thing too. That's what Jesus was doing in the, out, out in the desert. It wasn't something that he said, well, I think I'll go on a retreat. It would be nice to go on a 40-day retreat, wouldn't it, and uh, get away from people and all that kind of stuff. That wasn't what this uh, time in the desert actually was. It certainly was a time when he had to come to terms with what his ministry would be. And then the next verse uh, tells us what the beginning of that ministry was, which was actually um, launching from what John the Baptist had, uh, had proclaimed, had preached. So could we have that? After John had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. In this very stark, compact, um, concise way of describing this that that Mark has, you, if you really pay attention to the words and what's behind the words, like the Spirit drove Jesus into the desert, into the wilderness. Now, after John had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, which was launching from what John the Baptist was doing. What happened to John the Baptist? Well, he got arrested and he was eventually beheaded. Jesus had to know that in following in the footsteps in the beginning here of following in the footsteps of John the Baptist, he was going to suffer the same fate as John the Baptist. So right at this point, at the very beginning, he was stepping forth into what he knew would lead to his, to, to his death, to his arrest and his death. Uh, and, uh, you know, but, but I'm, f this foreknowledge of Jesus, of his passion and death, is not something that he had to be God in order to know. He only had to have common sense. He only needed to, to be aware that as a result of the Spirit driving him into the desert and what happened there, and his own, you might say, change of mind or adopting the mind of God through the Spirit, he had to know that uh, this was not going to end in any way other than what John the Baptist had to suffer. Now, for the resurrection and whatever knowledge Jesus may have had of the resurrection, we'll leave that for the moment in God's hands. Um, it's it's important for us maybe now to think, you know, we can say, oh, well, Jesus knew he was going to rise again from the dead and all that, you know, so that doesn't make it so bad. Well, if he was fully human, I don't think he had an inside track uh, on us. He didn't have an advantage over us. We don't know the outcome. Our outcome has to be known only by faith. His outcome, actually, humanly speaking, had to be known only by faith. We can't say his divine nature gave him an advantage over us that we don't have. And uh, no, he, he participated in everything that we are. So what was this? Uh, the kingdom of God is at hand. That's what John was preaching. Uh, the, the restoration of the way that God intends things to be. Now, repent. We reflected before on the meaning of repent. Essentially, it is get over yourself. Change your, change your whole orientation of being from self-centeredness to other-centeredness. Get over yourself. Um, and believe in the gospel. The gospel the word gospel is one that we often take for granted. You know, we say, well, it's the good news. And uh, sometimes priests will, you know, replace the word gospel with good news because people know what good news is and they don't really know what gospel is. Well, if you just replace it with good news, you don't really know what gospel is anyway, either. 
uh, the word gospel comes from the, the, the Greek is evangelion, but the word gospel comes from a uh, what the proclamation of the king or the emperor was. In other words, the emperor's uh, apostles, which they were, representatives, the apostles of the emperor, and that was a Greek word, you know, would ride into a town and they would have a marble plaque on which was written the decree of the emperor. That decree of the emperor in the in the Greek and Latin was called the Evangelium, the, the Evangelium of the Emperor. The, the Evangelium, and that means good message. Of course, as we know, a lot of decrees of emperors now as well as then are not necessarily good news. Uh, but the emperor and his henchmen would always proclaim them as good news. So. God recognized as the king of his kingdom, the gospel is his decree. And so we want to know what is the decree of God the king. Look at Christ and listen to him and follow him and you will discover what this decree of God is. So it's more than just what we would call good news. Um, Oftentimes, I think we, we, we think of good news as something that we hear that we can't, just can't wait to get on the phone to tell someone else. Uh, that, too, was part of the spread of the good news in the early church, what some, what some authors have called gossiping the gospel. If you really are on fire with the gospel as good news, my God, you want to share it. Get on the phone and tell everybody, boy, do I have something juicy for you. God is triumphing. God in Jesus is, uh, is our Savior, and, and so on and so forth. So that one word, gospel, is far richer in meaning than we ever really thought. First Sunday of Lent, now the second Sunday of Lent, Transfiguration. Who has it? Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain apart by himself. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no pole on earth could reach them. Then Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were conversing with Jesus. Okay. Um. The gospel mentions fuller. His clothes became dazzling white, such as no fuller on earth could bleach them. We have people named fuller. Uh, they were not exactly, they didn't exactly have a very gracious job because uh, fulling meant that uh, the Raw cloth or the raw wool had to be cleansed, had to be cleaned, and had to be whitened. And what that was done was actually, with bare feet, pounding on it in a vat of urine. It was the uric acid in the urine that contained the bleaching agents that processed the uh, process the cloth. But, uh, you know, natural wool, uh, even coming from a white sheep, is going to be rather dirty gray in appearance. Uh, how do you get them white? Well, it's the fuller who does that. It's cleaning, kind of bleaching, using a bleaching agent, which bleaching is never a pleasant process, and uh, then giving it substance, giving it body, and they would use other uh, chemicals and other means for, for uh, doing that. So um, that's just kind of an aside that I couldn't resist sharing. Um, the appearance of Elijah and Moses 
represent the entirety of the Old Testament. The, the entirety of everything that is contained in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, the entire, uh, not just the book, the entire history of God's relationship with his people embodied in the law and in the prophets were kind of there present witnessing to Jesus. Now, um, Okay, let's let's go on. I'll I'll interpret a little bit more in the in a moment. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And hardly knew what to say, for they were so terrified. So what did they say? Rabbi, it's good for us to be here, let's make tents. What was the meaning of the tents? Well, Tabernacles is kind of the word. We, we call the repository, the place where we reserve the Blessed Sacrament as a tabernacle, but what tabernacle actually meant was a, 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 um, a tent out in the desert while you're traveling, a sojourn. It also meant the uh, tents that housed an army and the command of the army when they're out on campaign. So what, what Peter was actually saying here is, boy, I'm glad that you've given up all this cross talk and suffering and rejection talk, and you're now talking some sense. You know, let's make this your, uh, uh, our uh, headquarters. Uh, let's erect our tents here. Now there's you, there's Moses and Elijah. We've got the whole We've got the whole leadership team. We've got our generals here. Now let's erect the tents and gather the army and really beat the heck out of those Romans and drive them into the sea and uh, restore the kingdom of Israel to restore us to dominance in the entire world like God wants us to be. Jesus, you're finally talking sense. That is kind of... I think the sense that, that, that Peter had at that time uh, when he says, let's make three tents. Let's make this our headquarters. Now, how does Jesus? Then a cloud came, casting a shadow over them. When the cloud came, they were going just as by the mother of Christ, listened to him. Suddenly they turned around. They no longer saw anyone. Something that would be in the minds of both the writer and the hearer of these Gospels was there was a certain development, parallel and development with the baptism. At the baptism of Jesus, the uh, heavens opened and the voice comes that others seem to have heard but was addressed to Jesus. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, that's something really great for God to say. Of course, God then sends his spirit and drives him into the desert, which was not exactly um, a desert resort. Um, here, the same cloud casts a shadow over them. That's got rich significance from the Old Testament. And the voice says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him not speaking to Jesus, but speaking to the apostles. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Now, if you look at what came before the transfiguration, it is very easy to add a word to that uh, statement. This is my beloved son. Listen to him, dummies. <laughs> because they weren't listening to him. You know, this is after the first time that Jesus predicts to them his passion. You know, I'm going to Jerusalem to suffer and die, and on the third day will rise from the dead. But that obviously had to be revelation from God. It didn't take much it uh, didn't take any supernatural knowledge for him to know that if he went to Jerusalem, the likelihood is 
he would he was walking into his own death and that's uniform in all the gospels and they were saying of course you know this can't happen to you no 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 and they were oblivious to him so the real purpose of this transfiguration was to give them a glimpse of his glory as the Son of God, yes, but in doing so, to say, stop, stop putting your own desires into this, your own intentions. Stop, stop make, trying to make Jesus something that he isn't. Stop trying to make him your own kind of Messiah. Listen to him. Listen to him. Now, we see from when they went down the mountain, uh, they didn't seem to be changed at that moment. It was only after the, the uh, Holy Spirit comes, after the resurrection and ascension, that they really began to fully understand this. So what happens as they come down the mountain? As they were coming down from the mountain, he charged just a little footnote about um, Mark's gospel that throughout Mark's gospel he continually tells the people who received his healings, who saw his miracles, not to tell anybody. Be quiet about it. And they continually disobeyed him because, uh, because they were filled with what they thought was good news. Hey, he healed me. Come on, he'll heal you too. And, and they would try to make him the kind of king that he was not. Same thing here. Uh, the disciples still did not understand even after this. So he said, you know, until you do understand it, be quiet about this. Don't spread this about because people will then be coming for the wrong reasons. They will be looking at me as, as the general who's going to uh, kick the Romans behind and kick them out of uh, uh, take them out of our land and restore the kingdom, and that's not what my kingdom means. Okay, third Sunday. We're going into John now. Who has third? Since the Passover of the Jews was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found, he found in the temple area those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves, as well as the money changers seated there. He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and oxen and spilled the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, take these out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. Okay, this is an, an event that is narrated in all four Gospels. Uh, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it occurs at the beginning of Holy Week, after Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Here in John, it, begin, it occurs at the beginning of Jesus' ministry as kind of defining that his role as coming to purify the worship of um, the temple worship and to bring it to fulfillment as he will say later and destroy this temple that would be his body and he will raise it up in three days. So as is so often the case in John, he's taking these events and making them signs of transformation from the old order to the new order that Jesus is doing, uh, that, that Jesus' ministry is. Just one little of course, this is so dramatic, it's a subject of a lot of art for throughout the ages. But uh, one of the uh, little interesting things that uh, if you recognize that the people who knew John's gospel were probably familiar 
least with the stories, if not the text, of what was in the other Gospels, in the Gospel of Luke, what was the sacrifice that was offered for the uh, redemption of the firstborn for somebody who was poor, who could not afford a sheep or goat or, or cattle. It was doves. And people would have to buy those doves in the temple precincts. And so it looks like he is being a little more gentle with those who are selling doves. And people would say, aha, uh -huh, well, uh, he himself was ransomed by the sacrifice of the doves in the uh, Luke's account of the presentation in the temple. So uh, that's just kind of one of those little touches here that we find in, in John's gospel. Let's go on. His disciples recalled the words of scripture, zeal for your house will consume me. At this, the Jews answered and said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered, and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So you see, what John is doing is presenting Jesus as doing something and then interpreting what he is doing. And he's saying basically that the temple worship itself, he's not just purifying the old temple worship, but the temple worship itself is going to be transformed because the new temple will be his body. Go ahead. The Jews said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Therefore, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they came to believe the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. One of the things that we see a lot in the Gospels, and particularly in John's Gospel, is something of a bridge effect, you know, where um, he's interpreting the meaning of various events and bridging over to the understanding will only be when the, un the meaning will be understood only in view of the resurrection. So the Gospels are really a, all of them, are an exercise in hindsight. They're not sort of like a newsreel account. Um, they're not just telling it like it happened. They're telling it like it is from the perspective of the full meaning that is revealed only after the resurrection. So now we go to the conclusion of that section. While he was in Jerusalem for the feast of Passover, many began to believe in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus would not trust himself to them because he knew them all and did not need anyone to testify about human nature. He himself understood it well. Again, you have a sense of a bridge. This, John presents this as taking place right at the beginning of his ministry. This Passover is the first Passover uh, in, his, in his public ministry. There's probably the Passover of his death and resurrection would probably be the third Passover after this. So he's making use of the Passover as saying, here's the beginning of what's going to be fulfilled in a couple of years. Now, we move on to John chapter 3. We're still towards the beginning of, uh, of, of John's gospel. And Nicodemus. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. Now, here we are, still towards the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He is still in Jerusalem. 
Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea apparently knew each other, were friends, were members of the Sanhedrin, the ruling court of Jerusalem, and were secretly disciples of Jesus. They had to be secret, coming to him by night, because, uh, well, they were afraid of the other Jewish leaders who were in opposition to Jesus. So it's interesting that you know, they were secret followers, but they did not have the courage to make that break, to have that metanoia, to get over their connections with their old life in order to follow Jesus fully. They are, in some ways, pictures, images of all of us who sort of, I hate to use the word, don't be offended by it, but who sort of dabble in, uh, in holiness, dabble in doing what God wants, dabble in being uh, disciples of Jesus. But when push comes to shove, will we really manifest the commitment that would be costly? even perhaps costing our lives, our reputations, our well-being, and, and so on. Uh, so Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, by extension, were probably kind of representing uh, those who were interested but could not, and were even having the beginning of a commitment but could not commit themselves fully. Nicodemus comes to Jesus and asks a question, you talk about being born again? How can you be born again? And that's when uh, Jesus gives him the kind of the, the lesson of which this is a part that, you know, this is something that is done in the spirit. It is something, it is, it is that metanoia, that repentance that he talked about, that, that coming out of yourself in the spirit, and that this is done by faith uh, when the Son of Man is lifted up, meaning crucified. Everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. That will be given to you, not something that you can earn. And then the famous statement, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Anyone who believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. We unfold that in the understanding, not just that, that Jesus came and did it for us in the sense of, well, we don't have to do anything, we just get the goodies, but all we have to do is believe in him. But that belief really means full commitment to be one with him. And so uh, we do not perish because of his resurrection. If we unite with him in the cross, we unite with him in the resurrection and in eternal life. Go ahead. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. That word condemnation uh, is, I think, a little bit problematic because it sounds like a judge. Uh, it, it sounds like a legal system. You know, there's a trial, and you don't have enough evidence to acquit you, so you are condemned. The judge pounds the gavel, and you go off to your punishment. I, I think that it has a little bit of a deeper meaning there, that we are, by our fallen nature, we are alienated from God. All that we are and do serves for us to condemn ourselves because God is irrelevant to us. And salvation, then, is that God comes to us and unites us to himself in Jesus Christ. And so we are reconciled to God by being united to Jesus Christ. And those who refuse that, and I, I think it's not just those who don't, don't know through no fault of their own, but those who refuse it um, are, uh, are keeping themselves in a state of alienation from God, which is that condemnation. Okay, moving along. 
And this is the verdict, that the light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come toward the light, so that his works might not be exposed. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light, so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. Okay, so uh, here Jesus introduced, and remember Nicodemus came by night. He was still in darkness. And so Jesus introduces this theme of light, that he is the light of the world. And if you are locked into yourself, you don't want that light. But if you're willing to let the light come into your life to expose your works, so that you can repent, so that you can place them into God's hands for forgiveness, uh, then your works will be uh, done in truth. Then your works will be one with God. Okay, the last one is uh, Fifth Sunday of Lent. Here, John chapter 12, we are in the last week of Jesus' life. He has already come uh, into Jerusalem in the triumphal entry, the Palm Sunday entry. And the verse right before this, verse 19, has the whole crowd witnessed the raising of Lazarus, which happened right before Palm Sunday. And they were teaching about Jesus. They were testifying about Jesus. So Jesus was uh, being buzzed about in the air. The wonderful thing that Jesus did that Lazarus raised from the dead and here he is. And Lazarus himself is testifying. That's why the Pharisees wanted to kill Lazarus too. He was testifying to Jesus and what Jesus had done. And then verse 19, the Pharisees said to one another, you see that we're gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. And then comes this verse. Who has this one? Some Greeks who had come to worship at the Passover feast came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. The introduction of the Greeks is very significant here. They had come from somewhere else to be part of the pilgrimage to the Passover, pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Passover. Uh, there's a large number of people who are called God-fearers or God-worshippers who were pagans who were very, very interested in Judaism. They adopted a lot of elements of the Jewish life and belief, and they supported the synagogues, too. That's another very interesting thing. They supported a lot of the synagogues in, in, uh, in the diaspora, but they were not prepared to go the whole route. They were not prepared to uh, undertake circumcision, or the dietary regulations, or all of the other meticulous observance of laws that really meant uh, the commitment to, uh, to Judaism. So apparently they were even attracted enough to Judaism that as Gentiles, as Greeks, they joined in the pilgrimage to come to Jerusalem. There they must have heard about this Jesus by his reputation. So they wanted to see him. Uh, they were they were outsiders who were sort of almost insiders. Um, in fact, one early Christian writer said these God-fearers were people who had one foot in the synagogue and the other foot in the pagan temple. And uh, so they were looked on with somewhat suspicion by a lot of Jewish people, and yet they were sincere seekers, and we'll see that in the early church. Paul especially went out after them and saw in them the, the ones to, who were most ready for the good news of Jesus. So they come to Philip from Bethsaida. Bethsaida was north of the Sea of Galilee 
kind of at the borderland of pagan territory. Uh, so Philip and then Andrew, who was also from Bethsaida, went and told Jesus about this. Now it's interesting, Jesus completely ignores these Greeks. They come in, he ignores them, and he begins to talk about something else. So let's see what else he talks about. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. He seems to be ignoring them, but one might ask, is what he is saying actually addressed to those who are not Jews, who are interested? Because he's interpreting that his death is going to produce fruit beyond just that grain of wheat, beyond just himself, just beyond just what the, the grain of wheat that is planted. So in other words, he is alluding to the universal dimension, not just for the Jews, but the universal dimension for all people of what he is about to do. Go ahead. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there also will my servant be. The Father will honor whoever serves me. Now, what he is doing here, I think, is going, it's sort of like, have you ever asked somebody a question? And then they begin to answer it, and then they kind of just go off into their own reverie. And uh, that seems to be something that Jesus is doing here. He's, he's going off into a uh, deeper explanation and understanding of what, his, what the significance of his death and resurrection is going to be for all people. Remember, this is taking place right before it happened, just about two or three days before, the, uh, before Jesus was arrested. So let's finish up here. I am troubled now, yet what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But it was for this purpose that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd there heard it and said it was thunder. But others said, an angel has spoken to him. Notice in the first part of this section, uh, we have kind of the, the dialogue or the monologue, if you will, that Jesus had uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. That uh, he basically says, I am, you know, I'm troubled. Uh, and, and is looking at what's going to happen, knowing what's going to happen. Father, save me from this hour. That's what he cried out in the Garden of Gethsemane. So John does not depict that agony in the garden, but there's a little hint of that agony right here. Uh, and also a hint of his final yielding to the Father. Yes, this is why I came. I can't say, Father, save me. And then the affirming voice comes that I have glorified it and glorify it again. Glorifying his own name, not Jesus' name, but the name of God. So uh, that is kind of the our preparation for Lent. Obviously, there's a lot more to say. I took an hour and ten minutes to say what little I did. Uh, it's also Valentine's Day tomorrow, as we are quite well aware. And, uh, but we want to show our commitment to Jesus Christ, not merely by ashes on our forehead, 
but by the love and service of our lives. And the next banquet of the word, Tuesday, March 20th, the week before Palm Sunday. So thank you very much. Thank you. God bless you all. <laughs>